So now we can do a little application to the US labor market. <coughs> uh, just to wrap up, because all these things actually can be measured. So, first statistic, you know, are the recruiting costs, and so this, you know, you need to have evidence on how many people, uh, workers, how many workers are devoted to recruiting, and it turns out that there is evidence on that, and uh, so if you look at um, the papers that are assigned as reading, they discuss that evidence, and in particular, the, um, the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the US, conducted a wide range survey in uh, 1997, which was called the National Employer Survey, uh, which involved you know 5,000 5, firms or something like that. And uh, what that survey found was that roughly 2.5% of uh, labor cost in firms are devoted to recruiting. So that's kind of the key fact here. That's a good number uh, to remember. 2.5% of labor cost are devoted to recruiting in the US. That's in the US and that's in 1997. 1987. Um, so this means that roughly 2.5% of the workers in firms are recruiters. Okay, uh, so that's uh, you know that's that's a useful statistic to have in mind. People don't really know that. People think that the recruiters of human resources is tiny. You know, like you ask people that say I don't know less than one percent or half a percent or 0.1 percent or something like that. But it's much bigger than that. The recruiting, the time that people spend recruiting and the number of recruiters that you have in firms is, is much bigger than that. So it's a couple of percentage points, like 2.5, 3 percent, and it seems to be similar in other countries. This comes from the US, but it's true more generally. Um, and so with that number, what you, if you do a bit of calculation, what you back out is a value of R that's roughly you know, something like 0 0.7. Okay. Um, so the number of workers per vacancy per unit, you know, per unit time is roughly 0 0.7. Okay. Uh, so it means that one worker can deal with one over 0 0.7 vacancy, so a bit more than one you know, maybe like 1.5 vacancy uh, at any point in time. Okay, that's what it means. Um, okay, so we have a value for R. Then we need a value for Z, the social value of unemployment. Um, and then again, the papers that are assigned as reading, <coughs> they talk about, you know, how much people value unemployment. And here's a key fact is that um, during, so when you become unemployed, you're losing all your income, right? And uh, so that, in, you know, so it means, let's say if you don't do it, you know, your income is lost, so your marginal product of labor is going to be lost. Nevertheless, if you enjoy leisure, if you enjoy home production, you're able to compensate a little bit for all that, uh, all that income that's lost, and the income that's lost, it's, your, it's what the firm pays you, that roughly represents your marginal product. Um, you know, wages are close to marginal products um, in reality. Um, and so what people have found is that between 13% and 35% um, so, uh, you know, uh, of lost earnings, which are roughly uh, you know, labor productivity, so when you lose your job, you lose your earnings. If firms pay you at firm productivity, it means you lose, you know, what you lose in terms of earnings represents your productivity. And between, you know, say 10 and 30, 35% of that actually is going to be replaced by leisure and uh, home production. So people behave as if through leisure and through home production, they were able to earn between 13% and 
of what they earn when they had a job. So, you know, th what that means is that the value for, for a person of home production of leisure is roughly 13% between 13 and 35% of what they would produce in a firm. Okay, so the social value of unemployment relative to employment is between 13 and 35%. Leisure and home production. Okay. Uh, so what that means that the the social value of unemployment relative to employment is between. Z represents exactly that. So Z is between uh, 13% and 35%. And so if we take you know, a midpoint of that value, you'll get something like Z. If you take a midpoint, you get Z is about, say, you know, one quarter, 0.25. Okay, um, so this is you know kind of roughly you know you can uh, you can play around with this number, but it's a good value. So it's just saying that if we look at a social perspective and you look at a, an employed worker is going to produce goods and services for society, if, when you're unemployed through production and leisure, you can produce roughly one quarter of that. That's how people behave as if that, that's roughly what was going on. Okay, so it means people don't do anything when they are uh, when they are unemployed. They do. You know, they do maybe about a quarter of what they would do if they had a job in terms of productivity. Um, okay, so once you have this, we have R, we have Z, the last thing that you need is epsilon, the elasticity of the Pelvich curve. That's really easy to, to, to figure out what that is because um, the, the elasticity of the Pelvich curve is, uh, is tightly related to the slope of the Pelvich curve. So we know that the elasticity of the Pelvich curve, epsilon, is D log v d log u. So what that means is that it's a slope of a curve uh, log v versus log u. Right? So uh, if you plot log of v against log of u, the slope of that relationship will be epsilon. And in fact, that's how you always estimate elasticities. You can just, um, you, know, you can just plot log of variable against the log of the other variable. The slope of that relationship would be an elasticity. Uh, so if I plot log of u with log of v, uh, then I know by looking at the slope of that relationship what my elasticity is. So you know, more formally, if I run a regression, of log of v against log of u, the coefficient in that regression will be my elasticity. So we can do that, in fact, it's, it's very easy, so let me illustrate. Um, Right, so this is showing you, you know, all the vacancy uh, and unemployment in the U.S. since uh, the 1950s, and this is showing you like a first branch of the beverage curve because you can see the beverage curve is shifting over time. This is showing you a first branch, but you know, if here I so. If I focus on these green dots here, which are just like one curve when the Bellwitch curve is stable, if I run a regression, I get something like this. That would be like you know, the slope that I would get in my regression from this, I could get uh, epsilon. Oops, sorry. I'll get one epsilon. Then you know you can move to the next period. The Bellwitch curve has shifted. The slope has maybe changed a little bit. So you, you know you would run another regression. 
uh, a regression will give you the value something like this, and from this you will get another epsilon. Then you will move to the next period, the Bayevich curve has shifted out even further, but so it's not the same relationship, but you can still run a regression on this. You will get something like this. From this you will get an additional epsilon. Then you keep on going, then you get this is actually what happened in the 80s. The Bayevich curve is again stable for like 20 years, but at, at a different point than what it was before. But you can rerun your regression, you know. Basically, the Bayevich curve is stable, but for like decades at a time. But then after 10 or 20 years, it's moving. So you need to rerun your regression because your coefficient has changed in the labor market. So you rerun your regression, you get something maybe like this. Then you get a new epsilon, which is this slope. Then you know you have, then now we are moving <coughs> uh, to the 90s. Again, you have a new kind of set of point, new Bayevich curve, you would run a new regression here. You get something like this, then you get another value for epsilon, then you have the 2000 here, very clean line, but again, slightly different location, so you would need to rerun a new regression. You do something like this, and you get a different epsilon, and then you know we have what we see, so this is you know this is 2010, uh, 2019. Here, you know, you would run also a regression, you put something like this. And you get uh, you get the last epsilon. In fact, you know that's what I think should here. So here I'm showing you. you know, these are just the point from 2010 to 2019, and this is the line that you actually get that you you actually get when you run uh, when you run your regression. This is your regression line, the uh, purple line, and the coefficient is 0 0.81, so that's the beverage elasticity that you will get here. Okay, so a little bit less than 1. Okay, so very easy to do. And in fact, you know, that's an interesting exercise. If you, know, you have data for another uh, country, for another labor market, you can just, you know, replot beverage girl, replot, uh, you know, log vacancy versus log unemployment, run regression, and you'll get this coefficient of the beverage elasticity, and then you can recompute uh, the efficient labor market tightness or efficient unemployment rate in, in the country that interests you using this data. Um, and so this is a summary actually. Uh, so this is a graph that shows um, the beverage elasticity in the US uh, over time. Okay, so this is just summarizing all the slope that you would get by doing all the regression that I've just kind of graphed informally. Here you can see this is a 0 0.81 uh, that we uh, talked about for the end of the period. And so what you can see is that this beverage elasticity, you know, which is uh, what we've called epsilon, uh, so it's going to vary a little bit over time. It's not completely sterile, but it doesn't vary too much. You know, the lowest level is uh, around 0 0.8 what we've had the most recently, and the highest level is around 1.2. So it varies, you know, uh, roughly between 0 0.8 and 1.2. So it's always kind of around 1, that elasticity, sometimes a bit below, sometimes a bit above. And so this will have implications then for your uh, efficient labor market tightness and efficient unemployment rate.